Hello, and welcome back to Fire Instance Gaming. My name is Ben, and today we're going to continue on with Suzerain. Last time out, we pissed off Ciara again. Uh, we made a deal with Marcel Caronti in order to topple Walter Tusk. And we nationalized Burgess Steel in order to achieve said goal. So yeah, let's uh, pick it up over here in Whole Sword. Alright, Unified Education Language Act. The UELA passes the following into laws. Section 1 enforces that the educational institutions of Sordon will teach all classes, except for foreign languages, in the official language of the country, unless they are given specific approval by the Ministry of Education. Universities, technical colleges, and other schools that provide classes in any language other than Sordon will receive suspension of operations until they apply for the approval process. Section 2 enforces the law through defunding penalties and total shutdown of schools. Alright, we're going to veto that. A, that's a terrible idea, and B, we need to boost our bluish favor back up after our uh, little adventures down here in Valen. Alright, journal update is just that we need veto that, cool beans. Alright, results of the economic direction. With the nationalization decisions made, all that was left was for Sordland's two most prominent oligarchs to sign the paperwork, and so I called them both to the palace conference room. We soon showed Marcel Caronti and Walter Tusk in. They sat across the table from me, leaving one empty chair between them. Marcel was watching Walter with a vile smirk on his face. <laughs> Don't you join this bit too much? Come now, Walter. No need to be a sore loser. And watch your words. You're right in front of the president. <laughs> you little snake. You're just like your father. Whatever you say won't change the fact that you were done for. Your time will kill, be sure of that. That's enough, both of you. I'm not the one to put us in this position, Mr. President. Mr. Tusk, you heard the President. Now then, before the conversation is derailed any further. We soon moved over to Walter and fanned the agreement papers out in front of him. Mr. Tusk, here's the agreement that pertains to the nationalization of Burgess Seal and the transfer of the entirety of your shares to the state. He pointed to various sections on various pages of the document. You'll need to sign here, here, and here. I won't sign anything without reading it first. He started going through the papers. When he finished, he turned back to the first page, went over the whole stack again. And again. And again. I mean, to be fair, asking him to sign the paperwork that'll remove him from his own company seems like a stupid idea. If we're able to force him to lose his company, why not just, you know, do it? Alright, stalling won't change the outcome. I have to make sure I understand an agreement that takes my whole life's effort away from me. He started checking his pockets. I don't have a pen. Marcel immediately produced the pen from his pocket, and put it in front of Walter with a toothy grin. The pen had a large hard sword and symbol with the name of the company engraved on it. There you go. Walter reluctantly signed the papers after letting out a deep sigh. My pen, please. Take your damn pen. He turned to me. I'll never forget what you've done to me. Your time will come too, Mr. President, believe me. Did you just threaten the President of Solon? This is ridiculous. Know your place. Mr. Rain, are you just going to stay silent in the face of these blatant threats? He needs to be punished swiftly. Surely you can't let him speak to you like that. You little. Um, ew. Can I arrest him? Hold up, I'm going to check the guide here real quick. I think I can arrest him, though. We're going to go for it. Let's, uh, let's call the guards. You're right. Guards. Some time in Antel Rock Prison will teach him. Two guards waiting outside entered the room immediately and grabbed Walter Tusk's arms. No, 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 no. You can't do this to me. You fascist donkey. Dictator. Get your hands off me. Serves you right. Good riddance, Walter. I'll make sure to pay a visit sometime. Marcel. I'll destroy you. Good luck doing that behind bars. Mr. Rain, you're being played by this man. Mark my words, one day I'll turn on you as well. I'm not you, Walter. No matter what, I have my honor as a Cronty. Crontys always keep their word. Cuffed by the two guards, Walter Tusk left the room. Marcel left shortly after. Awesome. Alright. Whole bunch of things popping here. Let's check the political overview. Alright. Factions. Oh, that just puts uh, Caronti in charge of the oligarchs now. Or whatever, makes him the key figure, I guess. Alright, 
Codex is just Walter Tusk. Probably saying he's in jail now. Uh, okay, maybe not. No idea. Whatever. It's fine. Alright, looks like we've got one report and a couple of newspapers. So let's start with the report first. Alright, from Deer, Burgess Steel Nationalized. The Lutherberg Group spoke state, uh, jeez. Lutherberg Group spokesperson, Walter Tusk, has shown his discontent by calling administration's actions unconstitutional and undemocratic. A significant number of investors, both within and out of Southern, are canceling their orders, most likely due to Mr. Tusk's influence. Cool. Alright, newspapers. We got two from the whole sword post. First off, police launched successful raids. Earlier this week, police launched raids on shops and warehouses in Arbery City and Estort City. Their operations are reported to confiscate more than 2,000 illegal firearms and drugs. The captain of the police force in charge of these raids has released a statement saying that the shops are from the two notorious crime families, the Skinner and Coronelli families. Those operations were only possible due to the law enforcement budget increase. It has allowed us to launch investigations of the local police, purging the corrupted ones getting information about the networks of the Ministry of Interior. It appears that thanks to President Anton, law and order will soon come back to Sorbonne. And Nationalization of Burgess Steel Today, the government has announced changes to the ownership of one of the two largest private corporations in Sorbonne. Under President Rain's new nationalization plan, the entirety of Burgess Steel, including all subsidiaries and foreign operations, will now belong solely to the state. This move is expected to reduce the extraordinary amount of control the oligarchs have over the Sordish economy. The ex-CEO of Burgess Steel, Walter Tusk, has been silent on the matter and refrained from making any comments thus far. Nice. Alright, from the radical, Walter Tusk arrested. A concerning show of presidential power or a case of just desserts? How about both? Corporate fat cat and Lotherberg Group spokesman Walter Tusk has been arrested following a meeting with Anton Rain, who had just announced the nationalization of his company Burgess Steel. The corporations need more government in uh, oversight is indisputable, but a hostile takeover and potential unlawful arrest is not the answer. We hope someone in Holzord will be able to rein in, uh, rein, rein in and prevent further such power grabs. We got two from The Economists. Uh, Walter Tusk arrested. This may news from whole sort, so let's just say that Walter Tusk, Cordland's most prominent businessman, has been arrested. The arrest may have been connected to the ill-advised nationalization of his company, Burgess Steel. Tusk and Heart of Swordland CEO, Marcel Caranti, reportedly met with the president to finalize the nationalization process, after which Tusk was seen leaving the scene in handcuffs, escorted by a presidential guard. Given Tusk's wealth and immense web of connections, we expect this to be sorted quickly, but it is a concerning sign of what President Rain is capable of. And Rain's hostile takeover. President Rain's never-ending war on the free economy continues as he announced his most ridiculous plan to date, complete nationalization of Burgess Steel. Instead of trying to actually solve the recession, he's blamed everything and won the two largest private companies of Sorgland in a blatant escapism. In the short term, the assets of Burgess Steel will be completely moved to state control. In the long term, this decision sets back our country for at least 20 years. With Burgess Steel now belonging to the state, the competitive nature of the free market will slowly disappear in Sorgland and will cause a stagnation. Nationalization has never been the solution when it comes to recession, and President Rain has just doomed his own chances of ending the recession in his term. Alright. So, I guess let's head to the Assembly Vote on Constitutional Changes. Surge is driving me towards Grand National Assembly for today's historic vote. It was a big day. I wondered whether my attempt to change the Constitution would end any differently than Alfonso's. I looked out the window as the noise of the city diminished and saw that we were already inside the palace complex. The complex housed buildings of all government branches in the center of Full Sword. It was one of the biggest developments in Swordland. The Maroon Palace stood on a small hilltop surrounded by trees. We passed by the palace and entered the forest that separated from the Grand National Assembly. We drove on the small road that wound through the forest. It was a warm day, so I rolled down the window. I could hear birds singing from the trees. Are you okay back there, sir? Yeah, hey, Serge. I'm okay. How are you doing? I am good as could be, so. Serge made a left turn out of the forest and entered the vast garden area of the assembly. Uh, did you know that Mr. Tarakin's soul came to Ulsa this morning? I heard some politicians talk about it today. Apparently, it's the first time he's come to the city in the last five years. I thought he left the mainland and lived on Durer Island, never to return back to politics, but they're saying he might be here to exercise his member of honor rights for the first time. Ah, yeah, that's great. Maybe I'll meet him. I'm sure you'll meet him, sir. If he's coming here after all these years, he would pay the president his respects. Do you think he's here about today's vote? I mean, yeah, most likely. Well, I'm sure he'll support you, sir. 
Of course he will, Serge. Serge drove inside the gates of the parkway and parked the car. We have a ride, sir. Thank you, Serge. Uh, before you go, I want you to take this. My father had this pocket watch, and he said it protected him from the evil of this world. I want you to have it. He opened his hand and show, uh, showed me a very old-looking pocket watch. It looked like it was made during the century of revolutions. I can't take this. It must be valuable to you. I insist. Alright, very well. My father would be happy. I looked at the back of the watch. The year 1920 was engraved on it. I put it in my front pocket, gave my thanks to Serge, and opened the car door. Good luck with the vault. I walked up the white stone stairs of the Grand National Assembly. The entrance looked like a temple gate with, uh, from the classical era. The door opened to reveal vast corridors of wood and white stone. I joined the crowd of people who were walking slowly towards the parliamentary hall. Suddenly, I noticed Lucien emerge from the crowd of packed politicians in front of me. He looked relieved when he saw me. Ah, that sir, there you are. Have you seen Vice President Vector? He's nowhere to be found. I just arrived, Lucien. I hope Mr. Vector arrives soon, too. At any rate, how about yourself? Are you ready to finally face the assembly, sir? I mean, I'm I'm still a bit stressed. Uh, don't be. We'll face the results now. We followed the crowd into the parliamentary hall. After we were inside, Lucy and I separated to take our assigned seats. I went up to the mezzanine overlooking the hall and sat down. I waited as MPs took their places inside the hall one by one. After a while, I saw Gloria walk to her elevated seat at the center of the hall. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We will begin shortly uh, with today's agenda of the USP's proposed changes to the Constitution of Sultan. After a short while, everybody was in their seats. According to the current Constitution, constitutional amendments require a two-thirds majority in order to reach assembly approval. If the vote succeeds, the proposal will be sent to the Supreme Court. The proposal in question includes these points. She started reading the proposal of the assembly. First section of the changes, Article 57 is modified with the following. Uh, she continued reading the proposal, highlighting each section. Section 2, paragraph 36, she went on. May not exercise his right to... And on. The justices of the Supreme Court... Most well, the MPs seem like they're already falling asleep. A simple majority is considered... Uh, this seat is really hurting my back. Section 4, paragraph 44a... Felt like an eternity had passed. Finally, she finished reading the changes. I hereby invite all of you to vote. She struck her gavel down. A loud bang made some MPs jump up in shock as they woke from their deep sleep. As I previously stated, it would require a two-thirds majority in order to pass. You may now cast your votes. I felt the need to stand up and stretch. I looked down at the hall from the platform I was seated on. Some assembly members immediately walked to the ballot box to cast their votes. Most of them, however, began to congregate in groups around the hall, discussing the changes. All right, let's uh, now let's just go down and start talking. I don't really feel like being a crazy person screaming at him. I descended from the mezzanine down to the hall. As soon as I reached the bottom of the stairs, Kassara Keeban approached me. Mr. President, how are you feeling about the votes? I'm certainly hoping for the best. Hey, don't worry, we'll get through this. I'll go vote now, see you afterwards. He abruptly turned away from me and walked towards the seat. Then I saw Lucien wave at me. He was among a group of people in the corner of the hall. I walked up to him. On my way, I bumped into Mansoon Lee. Mr. President, I'm sorry. I didn't see you there. I wish you good luck with the vote. He gave me a cold stare. Excuse me. He straightened his tie and walked away. Oh boy, okay, that might be a problem. Hmm. Yep, that, that might be a problem. We needed him to vote for us. Alright, well, I guess we'll see how this goes. I finally reached Lucy, and by now deep in conversation with another member of our party, he excused himself and turned towards me. Sir, did you vote yet? We have to be quick. No, let's vote. I signed my vote and prepared the envelope. Together, Lucy and I walked to the center of the hall to cast our votes. He kept rushing me throughout the process. Where he bowed her head slightly in respect as she saw his vote, Lucy pulled on my arm and whispered in my ear. Mr. President, we may have a problem. Talking souls here. I know. You have to accelerate the voting process. We need everybody to vote as soon as possible. Uh, we don't know what he's capable of right now, but if assembly members see him, he might influence him against the proposal. Uh, 
Uh, should I talk to him? I would advise against it right now. They simply must focus on the votes. Any confrontation between the two of you would draw their attention away. All right, well, let's ask Gloria to speed up the voting then. I walk Gloria or walked to Gloria and asked her to speed up the voting. She banged the gavel several times. The sound echoed across the room. Ladies and gentlemen of the assembly, we'll soon begin counting. Please cast your votes if you haven't already. The pace in the hall definitely increased. The groups dispersed and MPs began lining up at the ballot box. Suddenly, Lucian pulled me aside. Sir, so, what do we do? He pointed at the back of the assembly near one of the exits. I followed his finger to see Tarkin still sitting there. He looked much older than he had five years ago, but I could tell he had the same fire in him. Some MPs already gathered around him were chattering in awe. The assembly gradually went quiet as people started to notice Sol's presence in the hall. Uh, let's see, do I want to talk to him? Nah, I should probably ignore him, because Lucian said if we go talk to him, that'll distract people. Uh, should we do something? We should have thrown for giving him the spotlight he expects. Maybe you can address him after the vote. As I was talking to Lucian, I spotted Kassar Kibner walking to the back of the hall towards Sarkin's soul. He bowed in front of soul and gave a military salute. Seeing this, more people started to approach him. Suddenly, Gloria came up behind us. Gentlemen, why don't you go back to your seats? Let's follow the procedure. Oh, by the way, we have 251 members today. As you can see, the Member of Honor is here. He's already cast his vote. How's he now, Miss? So, Miss Sorry, how many votes are missing? Oh, only a few. Alvin Clavin and three other men approach us with envelopes in their hands. And these must be them. Oh, good day to you, gentlemen, Madam Speaker. Good day, Mr. Clavin. I am sorry to take so long, Mr. President. There's a friend who needed more clarification on his vote. He gestured at the men behind him. Let's get this over with, gentlemen. They went ahead and cast their votes. Let's win this, Mr. President. He walked to his seat with a fist in the air. That was probably the wrong voice, but that's fine, I don't care. Now, why don't you take her back to your seats as well? Very well, we shall. We both went back to our seats, and I returned to the mezzanine and I saw Peter sitting in the chair next to mine. Did you cast your vote? Oh, yes, of course. He looks at Gloria. She and her assistants counted the votes. The speaker's seat was only a few meters away from our platform. I really hope this proposal goes through. I hope so, too. Well, let's see. Yeah, not getting the independence vote could possibly cost us. Which is exactly why I was trying to do everything I could to not be too anti polluted but... I feel like maybe doing the railroad instead of the highway might have done something. I don't know. I guess let's find out. We need to try to get Gloria's attention by waving at her. Huh, how many votes left? Gloria looked at Pater. She looked annoyed. It's looking pretty good. 20 more votes to count. Pater turned to me. Oh, thank God. Ah, that's great. Pater pointed at where Kassara Kibner was sitting. Ah, looks like Kassara over there is not gonna... It's not over yet, Pater. Let's not get overexcited. Well... A small, uh, single bang from Gloria's gavel reverberated across the hall. Everyone fell silent. The voting has been concluded. I leaned forward to hear the results. The proposed is 179 eyes and 72 nays. Thereby, the Grand National Assembly has surpassed the two-thirds majority and set through the changes to the Constitution. Oh, thank God. Alright, so somehow, even without... Uh... The support of the independence, I got basically the maximum of the vote I possibly could have gotten. That is honestly pretty fantastic. Okay. The proposal will be, pre be presented to the Supreme Court shortly for the final voting procedure. The assembly roared with all kinds of different reactions. Oh, yes! We did it! Ugh, not so fast. We still have the court to pass. Suddenly, Anna Sarkin's soul slowly rising from her seat at the back. He seemed to be struggling, and he just came for help. He stood and gazed around the hall as all the members of the Grand National Assembly went silent. Uh, let's just... Let's just keep watching him. I kept watching him as he stared at the MPs. He walked out the exit as two of his guards held the doors for him. Ah, oh, thank God he didn't do anything. In any case, the proposal's passed the assembly. Now you have to think about the Supreme Court. I literally just told you that, dude. I'll talk to the key figures of the court. We'll be fine. I have complete trust in you. Hey, nice. Got an achievement. Probably for 
actually managing to pass the stupid vote this time. Uh, after I talked with Pater about the vote, we both left the hall to discuss our next steps. We waited for Surge by the entrance. Okay. Alright. Let's see. So for our journal, we've got the reform package passed. Fantastic. Alright, let's check out the news here. Alright, whole sword post. Constitutional changes passed by the Assembly. The Grand National Assembly of Swordland on Friday approved the amendments to the Constitution that was proposed by the United Swordland Party. I officially announced the approval of the Constitutional Amendment, said Speaker Gloria Tory, after the proposal was passed in a public session. According to Tory, 179 lawmakers voted in favor of the amendments. Only one member of the Assembly abstained from voting in a session attended by 251 members in 250 seat Parliament, including President Rain and Member of Honor Tarkin Sol. Next week on Friday, the Supreme Court will also vote on the amendments, ultimately deciding if the changes will be implemented or not. Swordland Today, Reign's reforms win over Assembly. Today marked the biggest win of Anton Reign's term as the Assembly approved uh, as pro the yeah, proposal for reforming the Sword's Constitution. The surprise presence of Tarkin sold the proceedings shifted the required number of votes from 166 to a two-thirds majority. Still, Reign's new amendments passed with flying colors. Only one hurdle now remains, the Supreme Court. We're hopeful that they too will rule in Reign's favor so that the people of Sordland finally receive the change they sorely deserve. In the Lockhaven Times, Kiebner congratulates President. After the successful passing of Anton Reign's constitutional reforms, Kassara Kiebner had a private meeting with the President to congratulate him on his victory, sources say. Lining with Kiebner and his party was key to gathering the amount of votes needed for Reign's proposal to pass, and this meeting shows that the USP and NFP may remain in cahoots throughout, uh, through the remainder of Reign's term. Except we haven't met with him yet. I wonder if that's what the next exclamation point is. And from the Radical, new constitution passes the Assembly. Count of surprise, in spite of heavy opposition and a special appearance from Old Man Tarkin Sol himself, President Reign actually managed to get his constitutional reforms passed the Assembly. We have been advocating for change in Sol's dusty constitution for years, although it's doubtful that the changes Reign is advocating are the same as those we have in mind. Even if Reign decided to come down on the side of democracy and fairness, getting a proposal like this past Gloria Tory's gavel must have required a great deal of compromise. Getting approval from the Supreme Court will require even more. I'm sure it will. Alright, yep, all right, there we go. Yeah, meeting on the results of the Assembly vote. So that'd be Kassara Kiebner. Lucy and Pater and I convened on the massive balcony of the palace. It was nice to catch a breeze in the in uh, increasing summer heat. Both had grins on their faces, but Pater's got larger as he kept recounting our success in the Assembly. Huh, Phyllis, the first obstacle's been cleared. Congratulations, all of us. Great job, gentlemen. Pater leaned on the balcony railing. Huh, what about Tarkin Sol? Did you see him again? As far as I know, he's still saying whole soul. If he hasn't cared to pay his respects to President Rain yet. What the hell is it all about anyway? Him appearing out of nowhere. He came to the assembly to make a statement, but we still won the vote. I am sorry that we failed to warn you that you'd be attending, Mr. President. We should have been informed about his arrival. Yeah, well, Lucian said, we apologize. Um, let's let's not yell at them. It's all good. In a situation such as this, we would have expected Carl to report to me, but it's no excuse. We should have done our own research. All right, all right. Maybe you should have. Even Serge knew about it. Huh, how did Serge know anyway? He said he overheard some people talking about it around the assembly. It seems some of our respected MPs already knew about this. He didn't see how they were, did he? It doesn't matter now, does it? Yeah, I guess not. In any case, I'll conduct proper investigations into this. We should know every hidden old guard member is working with Saul. But for now, let's move on. Yeah, we have the first turtle cleared, but now we have the concept of grumpy old men in our way. I have to say, that's a fitting description for the court, but unfortunately for us, they are more than that. They are our largest obstacle yet. Also, you're forgetting about Mrs. Edmonds. They're not all grumpy old men. Yeah, the real trouble is our big daddy hawker. We can't let him control the court against us. We surely cannot. We'll need to work with Mr. Garachi and Mrs. Edmonds to undermine also. Mrs. Morgan has been reluctant to help with the lobbying of the court, but she has accepted to at least try and convince the justice to organize a meeting with us. Which means our lobbying efforts have not yet borne fruit. It will be up to you and Mrs. Morgan, sir. 
Well, Neil's pretty adamant about her position as a proposal. There's already one vote lost out of set of uh, there, eleven. So she's serious about voting against the proposal? I'm afraid she is. I knew she'd be a headache. Not to make some more depressing, but it's not only about her. It's not to forget Mr. Hawker and his loyalists. That's four or five votes gone, right from the start. Yes, we'll need to reach out to the old guard and Moritz in order to receive, uh, reach six votes. There's not much leeway. Do you think we can do it? We've come this far. Anything is possible. We may need there. We may need to take some extreme measures, though. Hey, we want to vote comfortably. I'm sure that counts for something. There is at least some pressure on the court now. The court still sees this as a threat. They will not be persuaded so easily. Don't worry, I'll talk to the justice and try to convince them. I believe in you, sir. In any case, we should start with the best bet. I'd ask Neil to arrange a meeting with Mrs. Edmonds. She's willing to speak with you. That's a good start. She's willing to talk. She's willing to cooperate. I'm sure you'll convince her. Lucy and Southern turn around and point at the side entrance to the balcony. <laughs> Look who's coming. It was Kassara Kiedner. He slowly walked up to us with a fake smile on his face and spread his arms wide as he approached us. Here you are. The most dangerous men in the Maroon Palace. Afternoon, Mr. Kiebner. Uh, let's see. Anything specific I should say to him here? Alright, the guy says, emphasize how bad the court situation looks. Alright. Welcome, Mr. Kiebner. How are you doing? I'm good, Mr. President. You must be feeling similarly. Our cooperation yielded spectacular results. Sarah squinted into the bright sunlight. God damn this sun. He reached down in his pocket, pulled out a pair of sunglasses, and set them on his nose. Did you three figure out the court situation? Most of them have been resisting our efforts, but we're working on it. It's not looking good. To be honest, it's not. I see. But we're moving forward with our alliance, yes? Uh, let's see. Of course, Kasaro. I'm looking forward to it. I might be able, also be able to help with this whole court situation. I know Mr. Garachi well. I'm sure he said he's not open to any talks before the vote, but I'm sure I can convince him to meet with you. That would be very much appreciated, Mr. Kiebner. Of course, I'll try to do my best. Anyway, I'll leave you three to whatever you were conspiring to before I came. The heat here is killing me. We should catch up soon. He walked back to the door and left the balcony. Well, that was interesting. So, it's safe to join forces with the NFP, huh? I'm not sure just how deep we'll dive in, but for now, we'll cooperate. Right, I gotcha. A coalition government with the NFP can mean a lot of things, but one thing is for sure. Mr. Keeper is a dangerous man. He has all the power we give him. We should be careful, sir. Lucien looked at his watch. I think it's time to conclude our little meeting, sir. There was a tap on my shoulder. Let me see you know Jonas in the balcony. Pardon the interruption, gentlemen. This is President David Vichy's calling for the upcoming foreign policy meeting. Perfect timing. Tell him I'll be right there. I will, sir. She turned to leave the balcony, then back to us. Congratulations on the victory, Mr. Vane. Peter. That's not suspicious at all, ignoring the fact we already know what's going on. Well, at least we did if uh, you watched the last playthrough, but whatever, details. Uh, she looked at Pater, or she looked at Pater in the eye as she said this, and ignored Lucien altogether. Pater's eyes followed her as she walked out. Getting pretty hot out here. Good lord, I need a drink. I can help you with that, if you want. Not that I'm finished with the arrangements, of course. Of course, fine when you're done. We'll go have a nice whiskey. Great, I'm also already watering. He laughed. Alright, gentlemen. See you later. They both left. Fantastic. Alright. Well, that was, uh... Certainly a little bit, uh, dicier than I had imagined it would be, but it turned out to be perfectly fine. And that also seems like yeah, as good a spot as any to call for today. So, as always, thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you all next time.